Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, McLean's Live in conversation from, uh, from my end, from my living room in Ottawa. I'm Paul Wells, senior writer with McLean's Magazine. Uh, and my guest, uh, who you see uh, there before you, is Jason Kenny. Uh, Premier, thanks for joining us. Thanks for the invite, Paul. I want uh, these weekly uh, uh, events that we're going to be having on Wednesday night to be uh, appointment viewing to the extent that's possible in this strange time. This is the second one we've had. We have invites out to Premier Horgan in British Columbia to several uh, federal cabinet ministers, uh, uh, public health officials, uh, physicians, artists. We're going to try and make uh, Wednesday evenings uh, a place where you can get, uh, where all of you McLean's readers uh, can get uh, um, a better sense of what's going on in the country. And uh, to that end, we're really grateful that our sponsors and partners of the Canadian Bankers Association have made it possible for us to bring Premier Kenny uh, to you tonight. Premier, um, speaking as you are to a national audience, I wonder whether you could begin by giving people sort of a situation report on the state of the pandemic in Alberta, and then we'll go on to all the various ramifications of this, uh, of this horrible crisis. On the public health side, first of all, thanks for the opportunity, Paul. Um, on the public health side, I think we're doing very well as a province. Uh, on the economic side, not so well. Um, with respect to the pandemic, we have uh, had a very low level of hospitalizations and ICU admissions, which of course is a key metric. Uh, and in fact, uh, today we only got 70 COVID patients in hospital, about 11 in ICUs. So we've got like 2,400 acute care beds set aside for COVID patients that that are not full, that's a great problem to have. Uh, we have hundreds of ventilators that we're not using. So we have, I can say with confidence and certainty, successfully flattened the curve. Um, and uh, with the exception of two very unfortunate outbreaks in meatpacking plants in Southern Alberta, uh, our numbers overall have been very low um, with uh, the lowest uh, per capita incidence of hospitalization of the major provinces and amongst the lowest in the a developed world. Uh, and part of that is because we just had a very well prepared public health system. Um, we have had a strong pandemic plan in place for several years. It was exercised just last November. And we have some just good old fashioned Alberta common sense in our public service. So on the first rumors of a strange flu in Hubei last December, our procurement people started surging orders for personal protective equipment, filling up our warehouses with uh, N95 masks and ordering more ventilators, for example. At the same time, and I think without even coordination, our testing people at our precision labs uh, started surging orders for reagent swabs and began studying more closely uh, forms of um, uh, viruses that have emanated from China. So they were well prepared. And so we've led the world in per capita incidence of testing amongst uh, larger population jurisdictions. So I think we're doing quite well on the public health side. I just uh, uh, two hours ago uh, announced that we are proceeding with phase one of the relaunch of our economy beginning uh, tomorrow. We actually closed fewer businesses than any other province. Quebec and Ontario could closed most of construction. We kept all those industries completely operating. So we were able to uh, control the spread with less impact on the economy. Let me add, however, a big however, that uh, we're affected not only by the COVID-19 global recession, but also by the total collapse in the energy, global energy prices. So we're dealing with a very serious double whammy in the economy, and that's after five years of economic fragility. Um, uh, before we talk at some length about the economic uh, uh, fallout, I wonder whether the relative, um, uh, relatively mild uh, public health uh, crisis has actually been a, a, a public opinion management problem for you. I've got family in Alberta, and what they're saying is, what's the big deal? Uh, why can't we just go to the, why can't I just go to the gym to work out? Why can't I, is that, um, is that a, a problem that you have to manage? Oh, very much so. Uh, it's um, it, absolutely, when people see the relatively no numbers of hospitalization and relative to some, most other places, uh, low levels of infection and, and fatalities, they, they, a lot of folks wonder what the heck is this all about? 
And of course, uh, on the fringes, we do have conspiracy theorists, or I, I'll just say extreme skeptics who, who believe this is nothing, this is just a, a uh, exaggerated form of the flu. Um, th those folks, those opinions exist everywhere. Um, on the other hand, Paul, we've done some polling at, and, and every, pretty much every week we're in the field because we want to know what the public, how the public views these issues, obviously. Uh, and it's only 10% of the Alberta population who thinks we're moving too slowly to reopen. Uh, about 40 in our latest poll, 46% think we're moving too quickly and about 41% think we're going at about the right pace. So I think we're probably in line broadly with, with public sentiment. I think in Alberta, like everywhere else, you're going to have a cohort who uh, have extreme aversion to risk and would like the policy setting to, to be shutting everything down indefinitely, which I think would be reckless. And then you've got another cohort on the extreme that would just say, um, let's, uh, let's just be careful about nursing homes and re seniors residences, but let, re let everything else operate. And most people here are, are somewhere in the middle. Um there was some controversy a couple of weeks ago. You gave your your um, uh, address to the province on the on the on the state of the situation, and you announced that there was going to be um, a, a tracking app for people's phones that would allow them to know whether they had been in contact with people who had the disease, whether uh, that, that would help sort of um, uh, track the extent of the outbreak. That read to a lot of people, and I, if I may, perhaps a lot, especially a lot of Albertans as uh, Big Brother stuff. And this um, uh, Alberta Trace Together app has uh, uh, really been a bit of an albatross for you in public opinion, I think. Yeah, uh, there's been some, I wouldn't overstate that, but th you're right. Look, there's a healthy libertarian vibe in Alberta's political culture. And I'm always grateful for that. Uh, that, uh, you know, I think uh, a, a, a healthy aversion to the abuse of state power or anything that resembles sort of the big brother state is a good, is a good instinct to have. Um, and I, I just say to those folks, look, this, this particular app is completely voluntary. Uh, you only download it if you want to do so. And by the way, if the more people who do download and use the app, the more quickly, effic effectively and efficiently we can trace and track confirmed cases and that allows us to reopen more of the economy more quickly. And what I've been trying to say um, to Albertans for several weeks now, Paul, is I think the optimal policy setting is something much more like uh, the successful Asian jurisdictions uh, in combating COVID, Taiwan, South Korea, and Singapore, who instead of shutting down entire segments of their economy, uh, took a much more of a rifle than a shotgun approach, much narrow targeted rather than a, a, a general approach. Um, they did so with very strong and early uh, uh, border restriction measures, um, frankly, quite aggressive quarantine measures for international arrivals and, and positive cases. And of course, using things like widespread use of face masks in public um, and uh, use of technology, uh, including tracing apps. In fact, the tracing, the um, Alberta Connect uh, tracing app that we're using, we got from the Singaporean government. Um, and I think 20% of the population there is using it on a voluntary basis. Now, I'll, I'll, be, I'll go a step further, uh, Paul. I, I do think we should be looking at what some of those Asian countries have done in requiring uh, folks arriving from uh, abroad, at least from COVID hotspots. I think we should make it obligatory in principle that they download tracing apps because we're not going to put people in a heaven forbid in detention. I don't propose we do so, but if you want to uh, ensure that people are respecting the quarantine orders, then you can efficiently do so through uh, through a quarantine app. Now we're not there yet. We're, 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 we're sifting through options in that respect. Um, but I think implicit in a public health emergency is that some high risk people will be under quarantine orders. And I think it makes sense that, that you're able to use technology to ensure that they are protecting themselves in the community. In the meantime, can this app be effective if, if even 20% of the population uses it and perhaps quite a bit less? Yeah, in Singapore, their, their view has been that uh, uh, it, it can be effective. Our poll that we just got back has said 11% of Albertans have downloaded it after just a week and a half. So we're moving up uh, the, the, the scale there. 
Um, you know, if, if one in five people who get infected by COVID have the app downloaded, you can do automated tracing of that cohort at, virtually at the push of a button and save yourself thousands of person hours of manual tracing work. That, that, those those um, uh, person hours, you can then focus on people who have not downloaded the app. So it, it, allow, it, it, it frees up a lot of resources for faster tracing and tracking. Um, I want to go back to the early days of the of the shutdown because it seems to me that there there must have been uh, um, uh, almost every government in Canada had to turn on a dime in a very short notice on that um, Friday of that that fateful week on on uh, March the thirteenth. You were planning to be in Ottawa for a first minister. I was in Ottawa, meeting. actually. Yeah, you were you were in Ottawa. I was sitting with Christia Freeland doing a pre meeting before the first minister's meeting, uh, actually on the Thursday. Uh, at about 11 a.m. and um, she got a note during our meeting and she kind of looked a bit startled and she said well the FMM has been cancelled the Prime Minister's wife has been uh, is being tested for COVID and he's staying home so it all and and, and I had to <laughs> I had to imp improvise a speech to the uh, C.D. Howe Institute uh, about an hour after that when every it seemed like every minute something uh, earth moving was happening. It, it's a day I won't soon forget. But actually, it was the previous Friday, I think um, March the 6th, when er, when it re everything really started to hit me. At about five o'clock in the evening, I, I, I saw uh, somebody sent me a leaked presentation from the American Hospital Association that was projecting something like 92 million infections in the US and I think like 12 million hospitalizations and a million deaths or something. And I thought, this must be apocryphal. This has got to be one of those fake internet things. So uh, I sent it over to our chief medical officer, who I'd only met once. Um, and I said, you know, here's my uh, run on these numbers on a per capita basis for Alberta. You know, um, we would have something like 130,000 hospitalizations. I said, is this at all possible? And she said, about 30 seconds later, she replied, the, the numbers might actually be low. So um, that's when it hit me that, that this was uh, uh, for real. And then in the same half hour, I learned that the impact conversations had broken down with Russia in Vienna. And uh, a friend of mine in the oil patch sent me an a, a, um, obscure text message saying, as we speak, men wearing hard hats are being deployed uh, to sites in dusty distant, uh, dusty, distant deserts to turn the valves to the right, surging supply into global oil markets. And of course, the following Monday, we saw the largest collapse in oil prices in history. So yeah, it was March the 6th when it all started to hit me. So now with perfect hindsight, and one of, uh, you know, one of my sort of journalistic tools in the last several weeks has been to guard against the cheap lessons of perfect hindsight. But Looking back on it now, March 6th is awful late in the process. Uh, President Trump had, had, had uh, instituted a partial ban on uh, flights from China at the end of January. There are, um, uh, there's a substantial sort of Monday morning quarterback movement that says, we knew that this was going to be a big deal in the middle of December. Um, uh, do you kick yourself at, at how, how uh, long it took to realize the, the, the extent of this? Well, I won't say it's the first time COVID was on my radar screen. It was, it, it's, I think it's the first time, because re recall that the public health establishment, such as it is in Canada, was saying right through to mid-March, really, that, that the risk was low here, very low. Um, and and I, I think, you know, all of us, Paul, in Canada had been through, uh, had been through SARS and, um, and, and, and other p p pandemic scares. And they all seemed to be, you know, relatively underwhelming. They didn't turn out to be massive pandemics that threatened our whole society. Um, and so perhaps we, be, we had all, or most of us, become somewhat inured to that. Um, but I will say this, as a former minister of immigration, I was concerned about the lack of constraints on international travelers, especially from hotspots quite early on. Um, I, because I'd been through this uh, when I was minister with the Ebola uh, pandemic in West Africa. And, and to be blunt with you, I, I recall having had to fight with the public health agency and the World Health Organization 
that was recommending zero travel restrictions on people emanating from uh, from Ebola hotspots, which seemed to me so completely counterintuitive. And and so when I started to see the WHO, and quite frankly, for that matter, PHAC, um, uh, sort of derived derisively uh, 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 pushing aside calls for travel restrictions from COVID hotspots, uh, that really dis disturbed me. And, I, and I, I did say to some people in, in Ottawa uh, discreetly that I thought they should be moving forward with travel restrictions from hotspots. Um, and I became a little bit more public about that by mid-March. Um, but I will give credit to our public servants, because I'm not taking any personal or political credit for this. We did have public servants that were very alert to this. And as I said, who as early as December began surging orders for supplies, which I think is one of the reasons why Alberta was relatively better prepared, perhaps, than other provinces. So full credit to those folks who were, who were ahead of the curve. Tell me about Dina Hinshaw, your, your chief public health officer. She has um, uh, not as long as a, of a track record record in this function as some other uh, uh, of her colleagues across the country, and is perhaps a little less known to people outside of Alberta. Um, I can't, cannot speak highly enough of Dr. Hinshaw, our Chief Medical Officer of Health. Uh, you're right, she's only been in the post for I think about a year or less, uh, and, and yet um, she's performed under enormous pressure with grace and wisdom. Um, what I, one of the things I appreciate most about her is I, I imagine that if you are a public health officer, specialist, epidemiologist, and that's your passion. Uh, I imagine that, that you're, you, you tend to look at the world overwhelmingly, and for some, perhaps for some exclusively, through, through a public health kind of risk aversion lens. But I have found our chief medical officer to be very balanced in understanding that there are other um, interests and, 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 and issues that, 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 have, that have to be part of the decision-making process. That for every industry, every business whose operations you suspend, everybody you put out of work, you are damaging society in at least some small way. You are creating economic deprivation. You are probably collectively creating um, uh, mental and emotional health challenges, which will have downstream uh, physiological effects as well. I, I, our doctor, uh, Dr. Hinshaw has been very holistic, very broad-minded, very common sense and practical in her approach, which is one of the reasons I believe we ended up with fewer restrictions on the economy than most other, other provinces. I think she moved with a much more of a surgical approach, and I just really appreciate uh, her. She is a third-generation Alberta farm gal, grew up in Sylvan Lake in, um, in central Alberta, so she understands that libertarian vibe in the province that you uh, started with. And she understands that we have to manage that politically as well. So, so I, I just think she's been fantastic and the results speak for themselves. You've, you've already mentioned the public health establishment in this country, such as it is. Uh, what's your beef with the public health establishment in Canada? Well, I, I look, I, I don't want to pick fights at, at this point. We've all got to work together and, and focus on, on getting past the pandemic. There will be ample time for us all to learn from the lessons post-COVID. Um, but I, I will just say this, I, I, uh, on a couple of points, um, I, I wish that we had uh, been, I, I wish that the Public Health Agency of Canada and many others had been less uh, had given less um, cred credence uh, to the World Health Organization in those critical weeks in, ja uh, in January and February when they seemed at least as concerned about uh, hurting the feelings of the People's Republic of China as they did about the global spread of the virus. You know, I, I just, when you look back at this, for me, the most single shocking factor in all of this was that China banned uh, Wuhanese residents from traveling to the rest of China while allowing Wuhanese flights to take people to the rest of the world and pushing the WHO uh, to oppose travel restrictions while maintaining the implausible fiction that there was no evidence of human-to-human uh, -human transmission. And I, I wish that we had exercised uh, much greater skepticism and much more common sense 
like the Taiwanese, the South Koreans, the Singaporeans, uh, the Japanese, the Israelis, and others did. Those countries that have performed best have done so because they acted er quickly. They didn't wait for the WHO to give them permission to do so. They, 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 they bluntly applied common sense. And, and I think that's probably the key learning out of this. Um, why do you think the countries you've just listed uh, um, reacted more quickly? I've got my own theories, but I'd be, I'd be interested to hear you on, on. Well, many of them are neighbors of the PRC, so they don't have the a choice of being naive about the nature of that regime or uh, it's uh, the mendacity of that regime. Uh, they, uh, that is their immediate strategic environment and they probably have better on the ground intelligence uh, and uh, than perhaps many other Western, many other countries, excuse me. Um, and the same applies to Israel. That's a country for whom national security is an existential daily question and they can can't afford to take uh, risks. They have to act quickly. Um, I'm sure they've exercised various scenarios of hostile countries uh, trying to create a pandemic spread in Israel. So I'm sure they have a very well advanced uh, approach to things like this. So I, I think it's I think it's countries who, for national security reasons, have a much higher degree of realism and a much lower level of naivete. Okay. What some people are saying is. Um, take as read all of your criticisms of the Chinese regime, the fact is we still got to work with them uh, in the middle of this crisis. That uh, if you look at most of the good science that's been done on the nature of this virus, there's a Chinese name on the author list because uh, not surprisingly, uh, Chinese academics are really well rehearsed on these matters and, um, uh, and, and, and so on. That if, that if you roar now, you shut down the pipeline of information that can actually help us beat this uh, this pandemic, you seem, you, you look skeptical. Well, that's what I heard from folks during uh, Ebola, which was keep the uh, borders open to the hot spots because otherwise they won't cooperate or something. I mean, it, it, the, the arguments seemed just so uh, completely abstract and, and, and uh, uh, irrelevant to the public health imperative. So look, uh, 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 Paul, uh, obviously we, we have to try to maintain constructive relations with, with the PRC for, for a lot of obvious reasons, but uh, that should not exclude them from appropriate accountability uh, for the way in which they conducted themselves in December through March on this. Um, and then there's the other big uh, thing that everyone knows about China, which is that we get just a huge proportion of our manufactured goods from there. And we have been dependent on Chinese sources for a lot of the personal protective equipment that we need to um, uh, to protect against this outbreak. You are far from being the only public official who says that's got to change. It, can it feasibly change? Yes, not overnight, but we have, from the very beginning, been trying to diversify our supply chains and uh, for equipment. But more importantly, this is a wake-up call to uh, at least those of us in North America to reshore or onshore uh, so much of the manufacturing um, and product development that we allowed incrementally uh, to move uh, to a place whose strategic interests are not aligned with ours. And I think that's a, that's a good development out of this. Um, here in Alberta, we've launched our own, what we call our Bits and Pieces program, named after C.D. Howe's domestic procurement efforts uh, during the war. And we have tremendous industrial capacity here in Alberta, of course. Uh, we don't have the, the same manufacturing Scale is Ontario, but we have a huge petrochemical uh, industry that can help uh, in the future produce things like reagent for testing. Um, and we're, we're now we've now got operations. Uh, Suncor is working with folks to 3D print uh, ventilators. We our universities have some of the top engineering uh, faculties in North America, and they're advanced in developing their own ventilators. I've got top exec retired and active executive working group. Um, to help us with develop uh, uh, products for the future. So I hope that that's something that comes out of this. You know what it may mean that we have to pay marginally more for PPE, for medic medical equipment, for uh, pharmaceuticals than in the past. Uh, but I don't think that's a bad thing in, in, if, if we uh, reestablish uh, our own domestic production of those things. Um. 
it's often seemed in Canada that we essentially have a, a binary switch when we when we get when we look for um, either sources of uh, imports or markets for exports. We're either going to get them uh, from the Americans and send them to the Americans, or we're going to get them from China and send them to China. You were at the cabinet table when Stephen Harper tried to switch our uh, Canada's energy exports from essentially north south to essentially east west. That didn't work out too well. Um, it, it, is uh, is a return of a kind of economic nationalism? Um, uh, feasible and uh, something that that um, uh, Canadian governments can work together on. Hmm. Well, I think it is to some extent feasible. I, I'm not proposing. I don't think any of us are proposing here that we return to the uh, to the national policy with massive tariffs uh, uh, against the United States. For example, we're all for I, it's pretty broad consensus for free trade within North America. For example, and free trade broadly, but. Um, uh, first of all, uh, uh, when it comes to energy exports, uh, I appreciate the federal government pursuing the Trans Mountain expansion and hopefully the coastal gas link for LNG exports to Asia. I, uh, I believe that what the, the crisis that our energy industry is going through, fueled in part by the predatory pricing of OPEC and Russia, trying permanently to damage the North American energy industry will remind us that this is not just our largest industry subsector, but also a critical part of national security. So um, I hope that will perhaps revive discussions about Energy East. I can tell you, um, Paul, there has been a coming together across the country in many ways. Every week I speak to my fellow premiers on our uh, Council of the Federation call uh, every Thursday afternoon. And, and I've literally been moved to tears on a couple of those calls to hear provinces with whom we have not always agreed uh, expressing a, a sincere solidarity and support for Alberta in particular during this economic crisis and our energy sector. Um, and, and so I've got a renewed sense of, of national solidarity coming out of this. Uh, we've been working, you know, the, 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 we, the, the fact that we were able to share millions of units of personal protective equipment and uh, dozens of ventilators with Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia is one expression of that. So, you know, uh, I, I hope there is a stronger sense of, of, of national solidarity, not only when it comes to this health crisis, but to our common economic interests. Was it hard for everyone to learn how to do federalism again, to really do federalism? Interesting. I wouldn't say hard. It's happened quickly and organically. Uh, one thing I've been impressed by is how uh, we've done it across party lines. Uh, you know, yeah. If you were to line Premier Horgan and I up on a political scientist's linear chart, we'd probably be furthest apart in the country, but we've probably worked most closely together on a day-to-day -day basis on uh, policy and, and operations over the past uh, two months. And, and so a crisis like this forces you to focus on, on your common interests and common values uh, and, and set aside some of the stuff that really constitutes political noise. Um, in terms of federalism, I think it, look, I really appreciate many of the things that the government of Canada has done. Um, not, to, not to say that I, I agree with every single measure they've introduced in the, in the past couple of months, uh, but I, I certainly appreciate the, uh, the ambition to respond boldly to the crisis and a sense of real partnership with the provinces. From time to time, I think we've heard from Ottawa uh, noises about you know, a national strategy on this, central coordination on that. And, and premiers have, have gently reminded Ottawa that we're the ones actually responsible for delivering uh, on the public health front. But we've learned through that together. And, and I think, yeah, this has been a remarkable um, a kind of reconsideration of, 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 of federalism in action. Sometimes you've had to put your elbows up. It was uh, your government and the government of Nova Scotia and the mayor of Montreal who sent uh, uh, public servants to airports to uh, enforce um, uh, stay-at-home uh, regulations and to, and to sort of uh, spread public awareness at a time early in this whole mess when you were not at all convinced the federal government was doing enough. Yeah, and, and that comes back to my early, I, I told you that quite early in the crisis uh, in, in late January and February, I was getting a frankly a queasy feeling about the inaction on border screening and security. And, and it wasn't this, please understand, this was not a partisan comment. 
it, it was a bit of a flashback for when I was in the federal government. I saw uh, some of our officials take the kind of um, laissez-faire, naive World Health Organization uh, approach to the, you know, to the letter. And, um, and, and, and so uh, I think it was on February 16th or March 16th, excuse me, that I actually personally, I got, I was losing patience. I actually uh, went down to the Edmonton airport, international arrivals and kind of showed up un, unannounced and uh, went into the international arrivals section. And I saw there was no physical distancing at the CBSA queue. There was nobody cleaning the, uh, these touch screens at the CBSA kiosks in between use. There was no apparent hand sanitizer. There were no masks being used by anybody. There, there was no, inf there were, they were not providing information on our provincial uh, two week self, -is self isolation requirement. Um, and I, I frankly uh, hit the roof um, and I immediately instructed our uh, public health officers to get located at all international arrivals in Calgary. Uh, and Edmonton and elsewhere to, um, uh, to, to to monitor what was going on, but also to inform people about the obligation to self-isolate. And uh, in fact, I think tomorrow we're announcing a, a stepped up package of measures uh, that will in include the use of thermal uh, body temperature scanners uh, and um, more concrete support for quarantine for individuals who arrive without a self-isolation plan. Uh, so uh, BC has done some of that. We'll be going further. You need to talk about federalism. This really is like the borders are a primary federal responsibility. I appreciate they have stepped it up, but there was a period there where they were not getting the job done and I was quite concerned about it. Let's go back to the prehistory of last October uh, when there was a federal election, you may recall, uh, and uh, the Liberals were cut to a minority, the Conservatives uh, increased their vote in your province and in Saskatchewan and a few other places. And, uh, and there was a lot of talk about national unity uh, and WEXIT. And the, um, I mean, the first step in a federal response was to appoint Christopher Freeland as your main federal interlocutor. Uh, and you mentioned that you were talking, you were in Ottawa talking to her when, when everything went pear-shaped in March. Um, how do your relations with the federal government uh, since the election compared to your relations before. What, and, and, and what nature of authority do you think Christi, Christopher Freeland represents uh, from the federal government when she's talking to you and making under, undertakings on behalf of the federal government? Is, 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 is she there to calm you down? Is she the real deal? What's that like? Well, first of all, I think the prime minister's appointment of Christy as deputy prime minister and minister of intergovernmental relations was a very wise one. Uh, she uh, has proven herself, I think, to be very uh, effective, and um, I, I've enjoyed working with her. Uh, she came out to Edmonton to sit down with me for almost three hours within, I think, three days of her appointment uh, for a very frank uh, and wide-ranging conversation. Um, that and, and I can tell you, my colleague Scott Moshe then went to Regina. He said that was the best meeting he'd ever had with a federal official in his like 10 years in provincial government. Uh, so uh, I had a similar impression that she was uh, approaching the, the, the serious um, frustration in the West with sincerity and an open mind. And um, I, I appreciate her efforts. Of course, laterally, those have been um, I, affected or I guess put on hold to some extent by uh, her uh, chairmanship of the, uh, the federal COVID cabinet committee. But no, I, I've enjoyed working with Christia. She's been uh, very responsive. Uh, she obviously has to represent the, the mandate of the federal government. Uh, but uh, from a personal point of view, it, it, I think it's great that there's a senior member of the federal cabinet who grew up in rural Alberta who understands uh, the political culture of this place, the values and aspirations, the economy, the importance of the resource industries to Canada. And, um, and she's been helpful, I believe, in in raising our legitimate concerns with her colleagues uh, just yesterday, something that, that, that's not a very sexy high profile issue, but we made an announcement about an equivalency agreement on federal and provincial methane regulations. Now, I know that's a, that's a bit of a wonky issue, but it, it actually is an issue that it represents potentially billions of dollars of costs to the Alberta economy. It's a pretty big deal. And we were getting very little headway, basically none, 
on that issue before Christia um, helped uh, to bring the parties together. Uh, similarly, we appreciate the, uh, the recent federal announcement of the credit facility for uh, large employers, as well as uh, the uh, federal funding for accelerated well reclamation that gets good blue collar folks back to work addressing environmental li liability. There remain a lot of other outstanding issues that we need to work through, but it, it's great to have an interlocutor, an interlocutor in Ottawa who uh, takes the provinces seriously and is there to listen and, and to work uh, uh, some tough, uh, often technical issues through the labyrinth of, uh, of Ottawa. Every once in a while we hear sort of uh, rumblings from Ottawa about the, 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 the government's, the federal government's sense of what the Canada of tomorrow is now going to have to look like, what the government role is going to have to be. And, and they say things like, we're going to build the green economy of tomorrow, uh, the you know, massive uh, infrastructure investments, government taking the lead uh, uh, versus leaving it all to chance. Uh, do you think you're going to have to sort of resume hostilities at some point? Well, we will always vigorously defend the interests of our province. Uh, that's what I was elected to do. That's what Albertans expect us to do. Um, I, uh, at the same time, you know, hostilities for us, I think what you, what you really mean is, is, uh, um, is that, first of all, look, let me rephrase it this way. Um, it's been important for us to maximize our leverage within the Federation because uh, truly, I believe, and most Albertans will agree with this, that we've gotten a, 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 something of a raw deal. We, we've been through five very, very tough economic years, and yet um, we continue uh, by far to be the largest net contributors to the Federation. And we don't begrudge that, just to be clear, we don't begrudge the role that we have played contributing over $600 billion net to the rest of the Federation since roughly 1960 about $200 billion net in the last two decades and still about 20 billion a year. We don't begrudge that, but what uh, drives Albertans around the bend is that, is that when we have uh, governments, politicians in, in other parts of the country who benefit from the wealth that we generate in part through our resources and our innovation here, who then seek to block and landlock those resources on, on pipelines and, and energy policy. Uh, and so really all we ask is we say is a fair deal where we can get market access where we don't kill the largest subsector or deeply impair the largest subsector in the Canadian economy with endlessly costly new uh, uh, regulatory uh, mandates, for example, like Bill C-69. We don't create massive uncertainty. These are issues that you and I talked about in Ottawa a year ago. So... Um, it, it's not about, look, I'm a proud Canadian. I always will be. My, my commitment to the Federation is unconditional. Uh, some people don't like that in this province. Some people think I'd get a lot more leverage if I were to raise the, the Wexit banner. I will never do that. If, if they want somebody to, they should find someone else to. Uh, I, made it, I made sure that when we created the United Conservative Party, we wrote into its Articles of Incorporation that we are committed to a united Canada. So um, uh, I hope, I hope that once we get past the pandemic, we'll be able to continue to make progress on, on is issues related to our vital economic interests, but we will be assertive as necessary. We've received back the uh, Fair Deal panel report, which is uh, a consultation we did uh, with some eminent Albertans on, on uh, how Alberta can get that fair deal in the Federation. We're holding on to that until probably the month of June, until you know, past the worst of the pandemic, um, and and you know, I, I hope that we can get a lot of those things done cooperatively. Um, you've been involved in politics actively since your early twenties. You've been uh, involved in electoral politics for twenty uh, three years now, and you've wanted to be a premier of Alberta for probably half a decade. Um, do you feel like your entire rest of your career has been hijacked by this crisis and that everything you thought you were going to be doing, you're now going to be doing something else? <laughs> well, <laughs> I never imagined, uh, like I woke up one day and our deficit goes from, which, which, we're, we, which we were trying to eliminate over two or three years, goes from $6 billion to $20 billion. Um, a lot of what we ran on, uh, just a year ago in our election in a very specific platform suddenly becomes 
uh, uh, out of reach because of the new fiscal and economic realities. So yeah, there is, I suppose, some truth in what you're, you're saying. Um, I, uh, on the other hand, I, I have to say that that time in public uh, life has, I, I, I think, made me pretty well prepared for this because I've been in crisis situations before. Um, uh, nothing of this gravity or depth. Uh, but I was, you know, around the federal cabinet table during the global financial crisis uh, as Minister of Immigration responded to various uh, crises, Minister of Defense, uh, some very hot issues. And, and I suppose that, that, that that's helped to prepare me for this, but I, I never expected to be going through something like this. And I think that's true of all of my colleagues. Um, is there room for a sort of a root and branch rethink with, with a public element to it? Uh, some sort of, uh, I don't know, we're going to have to do something else conference or something. Uh, you know, how, how do you um, uh, come to terms with the new reality and ensure that you've got an electorate that to some extent follows you in this new path? Well, that uh, it's not something you do at a, at a conference. Uh, there are some stark new realities here. I've already told Albertans in very explicit terms that there will be a great fiscal reckoning at the end of this pandemic uh, and because of this pandemic. Um, and uh, so uh, y you're right. There, 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 there's a need for us to um, make a very uh, uh, objective read of the, of the post-COVID world. Uh, and and so we're doing that in part uh, through our Economic Recovery Council. We've brought together some of the, the brightest minds and most successful entrepreneurs and others in, in the province people at a, in a committee chaired by Jack Mintz. Stephen Harper is on the committee. A lot of names you would recognize. And I just spent a day long a retreat with them. And uh, uh, we are thinking big and bold. We're not limiting ourselves in... Uh, developing the outlines of a economic recovery strategy. Uh, Paul, a part of the challenge for Alberta is this, that we expect the, the rest of the world will experience a fairly uh, pronounced V-shaped recovery uh, starting this summer, uh, barring widespread uh, second waves of the pandemic. We should see global demand return pretty significantly as, as it has already begun to do in most of Asia. And with that, um, you know, most projections see the global economy largely recovering by the end of this year. Uh, that will not likely be at all be the case for Alberta. I'm expecting something much more like a fat U than a sharp V. And that's because of the collapse of energy prices. We were selling Western Can Canadian Select at, at negative prices two weeks ago. And uh, the general, you know, the average projection is that we'll be in a, in a suppressed price environment for uh, something like 18 months. Um, so we won't have the same like juice we're to, to recover from the pandemic. We're going to have a, a much bigger economic drag, and uh, and and so uh, how to recover from that uh, is is going to take a great um, uh, great strength uh, and, and and frankly patience by all burdens. Premier, um, I promised myself I can see how many people are watching, and I promised myself that as soon as it started to dip, I would cut it off. The problem is that the uh, the, the participation has been rocks. I think people could take uh, uh, another hour of this, but I'm going to spare you, and I'm going to spare my own voice, and uh, we're going to we're going to end it there. I, I want to thank uh, once again our sponsors of the Canadian Bankers Association for making this possible. I want to thank everyone who's been following along. And I want uh, to thank you, uh, Jason Kenny, for uh, taking some time to share what you're going through with, uh, with the rest of us. Uh, thanks, Bob. I'm sorry if I seem a little um, uh, uh, tired, but frankly, I am. So that's it's, uh, <laughs> like a lot well, of- Well, I tend to have that effect. Uh, best <laughs> of luck uh, in the next uh, days and weeks, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. Appreciate it. Cheers. All the best. Good night.